good morning. Um, uh, I, my uh, presentation today is not the entire work that was done in Work Package 1B and Drive AB, but only refer to a, a certain part on uh, 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 predictions. So uh, it's important for us to know the current surveillance systems do not report on the number and rates of infection by resistant organisms. They actually report on percent resistance within a species. But what we need to know for uh, uh, decision making, both for antibiotic development and uh, other public health needs, is the number of infections. So we have the percent resistance. We don't have the nominator data in most surveillance systems. So we need to know the number per one million population. Usually, we don't know uh, the denominator data. And the data that is reported may be biased, or I would say even is usually biased. Uh, the reporting laboratories do not represent well the entire uh, country. It's not a random sample. The method of sampling and collecting isolates uh, for those uh, systems is also puts uh, biases into uh, that. And, and the worst of all is that most countries truly do not report to any surveillance system. So the data that is available is scanned. So um, trying to estimate the number of infections, uh, I, I just give here an example. We have done that for some organisms, and I'll give just examples. Estimating the number of infections by third generation cephalosporins and carbapenem resistant E. coli and Klebsiella. So to try and do that, we hypothesized that, there is, that the incidence of infections by susceptible E. coli and Klebsiella is constant in, 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 in different populations. And, uh, um, and um, so we estimated the population level incidence of infections by susceptible organisms using different imputations. <laughs> And I will go over that. The imputation, you know, they're complicated, but I will just uh, tell the principles. We usually have the number of blood culture isolate per hospital bed in the participating hospitals that is mostly given by the EARSnet uh, uh, surveillance systems. We multiply the proportion of bacteremia among all hospital infections to generate the number of inpatient infections. So if we know that E. coli is about 10 percent bacteremia for all type of infections, we doubled by 10, and, uh, uh, and multiplied by 10. And then similarly, we did for community infection, if we know that uh, you know, maybe 10 percent of all infections are serious infection, which are treated in the hospitals, then we multiplied it again. So you can see we inflated the number really dramatically. And, uh, um, and then we inflated the numbers for the proportion of hospital beds represented in the surveillance system for the country. Again, assuming that it's randomly uh, similar in other places, uh, uh, um, uh, again, we may be completely wrong. But uh, surprisingly, when we looked then at uh, the numbers, we found that our hypothesis was quite correct. If we, you look here at the, uh, the incidence of susceptible E. coli infections uh, per uh, population, and you look at the uh, proportion of the, uh, uh, of the hospitals reporting to the surveillance system, you can see that this funnel plot is quite narrow. And, and you can actually find that there is a similar number of events or this, uh, per uh, million population uh, in different countries. Just to put one caveat, all those countries are developed countries. Um, we then took our uh, calculations and went to a few places where we have uh, a true surveillance system that generated the real numbers. And you can see that there are really not many places where there are real numbers. But when we look at the numbers, you know, our estimates are in the range for most places. And we have few cases of a little underestimate or overestimate. Again, all these data comes from developed countries. Um, so um, I, I would say that we uh, feel quite confident that the methodology we, we used is actually working quite well, at least for developed countries. And um, 
we took those uh, 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 um, incidence rates, and one, you have the incidence rate of susceptible strains, and you know the percent of resistant strains, you can actually calculate the number of resistant or, and the incidence of resistant infections. And uh, we have calculated the number and inflated them around the world using the best available data on percent resistance uh, from uh, different uh, countries. And again, that represents the best available data. It doesn't mean that that's the real truth. And, uh, um, and, uh, and, and you can see here the numbers as uh, 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 we uh, generated. And um, uh, we did not calculate things that we felt that are completely unfair. For example, outpatient infections for carbapenem resistant uh, um, uh, um, uh, Enterobacteriaceae, we felt that that's really unknown how many of that is happening. In most countries that we looked at, uh, Western or developed countries, that's an extremely rare event, so we could not say what happens in other places. So um, we looked whether the same methodology would work for other organisms. For E. coli and Klebsiella, we were able to show that it works really very nicely. Uh, for MRSA, we had used similar methodology, and for inpatient, or what we call serious infection, because not in all countries all patients are hospitalized with those type of infections, um, it also works well. For outpatient, we did not feel that we have enough data to be sure that that outpatient is also, uh, um, uh, um, it's working well. Uh, for Pseudomonas acinetobacter and VRE, uh, we felt that we cannot do, use the same methodology, and that's because those infections are predominantly healthcare uh, associated. There are great variation between countries and even within a country between different location. So in order uh, um, uh, uh, to estimate and, and generate this data, I think we have to get much better surveillance data, and I think that currently available data does not allow us to generate um, a good estimates. Um, I uh, believe and I think that the glass uh, uh, surveillance system put up now by the WHO may offer a good way to, to generate those numbers. So uh, from here, uh, we uh, uh, went to predicting the future need for new antibiotics. So we need, uh, the need for new antibiotics is determined by the number of infection caused by resistant organisms. The number of future resistant infection is a function of the current number and the progression. So we have now the estimates of the current uh, uh, number and we have to look at the spread for the organisms that we were able to generate those uh, estimate. And to predict the future trends, we used two um, complementary approaches. One, we used mathematical modeling, and the second was uh, big data, data mining. So I will start with some uh, 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 mathematical modeling, looking at, uh, and, and, and I'll, I'll just show uh, some results. It truly does not reflect the work that was done. So. Um, we look at antibiotic uh, uh, resistant bacteria carriage and, and the time uh, uh, to stabilization of prevalence of resistance. And here you can see that if the uh, things that we usually don't know, uh, if the carrier status of a resistant bacteria is six months or eight months and everything else is equal, you will reach completely different resistance in your region. And, and especially in the uh, community. So uh, those small differences, so, and, and those data are usually, we don't collect it, we don't have it, we don't have the certainty of uh, how much is, is uh, true. And you can see that within several years, you reach stabilization. Stabilization is reached earlier if you have shorter carriage time and later if you have longer uh, carriage time and you reach, uh, may reach very, you know, twice as high uh, um, resistant rates if you have add just two months to a six month carriage uh, 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 duration, you, it becomes eight months it's for different bacteria that will change dramatically the level of resistance that you would see. 
Uh, of course, infection control may have great impact. So here we looked at, uh, at, at, at different uh, hospital settings and looking at uh, uh, low compliance, medium compliance, and high compliance with infection control measures. And you can see the stabilization of, uh, of uh, the, the pre prevalence of colonized patients within the hospital will change dramatically depending on your performance in infection control. And then we looked at the effect of uh, uh, different antibiotic stewardship interventions in those models. And I think the, 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 in those results are presented outside on the poster, so if you want to see the details, it's there. And um, you can see that it depends on how transmissible is the bacteria. If you have uh, what you see here in H, a highly transmissible bacteria, the effect of antibiotic stewardship uh, or antibiotic use is much higher. You can see on the left-hand side the percent of patients treated with antibiotics, and it can influence transmission dramatically. And then on the right-hand side, you can see different interventions. Um, one would be, uh, 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 you know, reducing the number of patients uh, who are treated with antibiotics, so from 40% to 20% will have very uh, important in effect. Reducing the duration from 10 days of typical course from 10 days to 7 days. And then moving from uh, non-environmentally friendly antibiotic to a more environmentally friendly antibiotics, uh, uh, so uh, uh, will also have a great impact. And you can see here, uh, we don't show it here, but in other studies that we are doing, the effect of uh, antibiotic stewardship, of course, is the highest when you have uh, medium level infection control. If you have perfect infection control, antibiotic stewardship will have relatively little effect. And if you have very bad infection control, again, antibiotic stewardship will have uh, little effect because on those extreme, there is either no transmission or transmission happening anyhow. So um, we also looked at um, the transmission and, 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 and to predict the spread in countries. And what you see here is the model that uh, looks at the spread of third generation cephalosporin E. coli in different countries. And we did that for several countries. And in red is the real numbers as presented at the EARS, uh, the EARS uh, network uh, uh, um, surveillance system. And, um, and the black is the hospital level bloodstream infection predicted, and the, um, the uh, gray is the community uh, level, which is uh, uh, deducted from that, and the prediction of what will happen and, and so forth. And you can see that uh, the prediction says that in Italy, uh, you know, we have reached about 30 percent, and that probably will stabilize around that number. And in France, uh, uh, we are about 10 percent, and that will grow to about 15. And, and that takes into account um, uh, the, the mode of spread. And so if, you, uh, if, if enough years have passed since the start of the outbreak, and for E. coli, um, it, it, it has, since it started, third generation E. coli uh, started to spread in the early 2000s. You're, after uh, 15 years, you're reaching stabilization in some countries which have low transmission. Uh, that will be a lower rate of stabilization, and in other, it will be much higher. So then we moved, or in parallel, truly, <laughs> We move to big data, uh, uh, big data, uh, 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 data mining, and here you see uh, the, the 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 major surveillance systems that uh, we identified and approach, and and many of them have uh, become available to us by the generosity of the uh, of the different bodies that hold those uh, 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 databases, and they allowed us to data mine those uh, databases. So I would say uh, just um, in a second that the, the, the great majority of the data that's available worldwide on surveillance of resistance was available to us 
to query. And I'm saying that because I will show you that that's not enough. Um, so here we sh I, I, I show what we have seen, for example, for the progression of third generation cephalosporin E. coli. And you can see here, again, two different countries, one uh, showing, or, or, or two different states. Some countries have medium level of spread or intermediate. Here we have um, intermediate level of spread and high level of spread. And you can see you can draw a sigmoid line of uh, progression of the organisms with different uh, sigmoids, one which is very fast and will reach very high levels, and one which is much slower but then will lead to a much lower level of resistance. And we have done that for different organisms between slow, medium, and high progression uh, fitted for each country and generating those uh, sigmoids. And you can see here the three sigmoids that we generated, and one would say that if you have a, a, a slow progression, you would stabilize at about 7 to 10 percent, but when you have a medium, you will it will take you longer, but you will stabilize, or faster, and we stabilize at about 15 percent, and the highs will stabilize at about 35 or so uh, percent resistance. So uh, um, we, we could, we, using that, we were able to classify different countries into different uh, levels or, or a pace of, of, uh, of uh, uh, spread. And, and you can see, but when you look at it, you can see that to do that, we had some conditions. For each year, you had to have at least 100 isolates sent to the surveillance system. You had to have five years of data. You had to have different conditions to allow you to do a reliable measure uh, analysis. The problem that there are really with all these data, there are very few data that you can analyze because not there are few countries that submit enough data year after year that you can analyze what is happening. So we were able to do some of this work, and you can see some organisms are spreading much faster, other less fast, and so forth. Um, but using now this type of sigmoids and those data estimates, um, so we were able here, that's uh, an example from our uh, beta version website, the real website I hope will be available in, in two, maximum three months. And, and, and that shows you can do for different countries, you can have the incidence, number of cases per million or total number of cases. You can choose here, you can see here, you can choose between E. coli, Klebsiella, pneumonia, resistant to third generation cephalosporins or carbapenems. You can have MRSA. Uh, you can have either outpatient infection, inpatient infection, all infection, bacteremia. And you can have a measure, either the number of events or the, per, the, the incidence per uh, a million population or the percent resistance. And you can have it by country or by region. And, um, and, uh, and, and you will be able to play with that. That will be open to the public. And then you can also generate some uh, impact effect in terms of death, a work that was done by the Tübingen um, uh, group led by Evelina Taconelli and Primrose, who I think is here, uh, um, uh, will uh, uh, assign the crude mortality for each type of infections, and the calculations are there. And again, that's a crude mortality. It's not attributable mortality. And uh, so that will be also there. We build the capability to add other things, which at this point we felt unfair to add, like length of stay and, uh, and cost and so forth, but we feel that the data is not strong enough that that could be added to the uh, database. And, that's some, and, and we also build those sigmoids, uh, and for countries that we had the exact data, we used the exact data and uh, the exact sigmoids, and for others, uh, we used assumed sigmoids, and you can change your assumptions, play with the data. And uh, those are the data, for example, and what is expected to happen in 2024 in, in different countries. And you see the, the, the rates per million population uh, in different countries today and as expected in 2024. And um, you can go up to 
2035, if I remember correctly. And, um, and also, you can generate the, uh, the, the, the total number of uh, infection estimated, and I think this number is uh, important for uh, uh, drug discovery to understand the mar market, to understand what is going to happen. It's also important for policymaker because if they are having on, on, a, on a rapid grow sigmoid and they would s look at the numbers and say, what would happen if I have an intermediate rate? I can reduce it to an intermediate rate. Those are the numbers that I will change and uh, will ask themselves, how can we do it? And we have models that can answer that. It's not part of the website. Of course, it's much more complicated. So those are uh, the estimates. We can generate it country by country under different conditions or assumptions and so forth. All the data is planned to be available, downloadable, so people can do with this data also what they want to do if they have other assumptions. So um, I would summarize the current surveillance system do not provide population level data that reflects the needs for new antibiotics or direct uh, uh, public health effort to combat resistance surveillance. Big data are not really big data, are not big enough to, to, to do good analysis. Very little data from the most populated area in the world is available, so truly in some places zero data. We were able to generate accurate estimates of the incidence of the total number of infection by some key resistant pathogens, but not others. We were able to generate prediction of spread for these resistant organisms and their impact. Uh, these data will be provided to the public in an open uh, website, and models can be fitted to specific country to generate estimates under varying condition which may direct policy of public health and public health efforts. Thank you very much. So I think we, we do have some time for a couple of, uh, couple of questions. Uh, David Williams, Discover. I think this is, this is interesting, but I don't think it's that useful for predicting how much we need to put into this uh, in terms of uh, reimbursements and everything. We need, we need length of stay. We absolutely need that. It's a major health care cost. And also we need revisits. If we don't capture those, we're not going to really know how much it's going to cost to cure this problem. Um, yes, we do not generate this data. Is it good? I mean, I've heard of instances, well, for example, in revision surgery for, for knee joint replacement, actually replacing a knee joint once isn't unusual. Ten times is, is actually uh, does happen. Yeah, I, 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 I completely agree, but I think that to do that on a global level, it's completely impossible. I think that even what we have done is a little bit, uh, I would say, courageous. And we were even afraid to call some infection inpatients because in some places you don't have hospitals. So what does that mean, an inpatient? And so if you have a serious infection, you are not hospitalized, you have other things. So I think that should be tailored in a country level uh, and, and a healthcare system level uh, analysis rather than global type of analysis. And, and I, I'm sure that can be built on that because we can, or, or one can, take those numbers and, and say how many of them are urinary, urinary tract infection, whom do they affect, how many are bacteremia, whom do they affect, and so forth. With MRSA, you know, how much will that translate into, into, foreign, uh, you know, into uh, a transplant surgery or, or, a, or, or a hip surgery and so forth. But to, to generate a global number on that, I think that's truly impossible or, or too early to do in, in this century at least. Okay, there's a question in the very back. There, Rory Constable from the UK Department of Health. Um, are you able to introduce a, a new agent into your model that would help you get towards Ramanan's uh, diversity value? Um, well, uh, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> the, short, the, the, the short answer is no. Uh, so um, I, I think one can even argue whether a new agent will affect transmission or not. 
uh, if we assume that it will affect, well, in, in our models, uh, uh, much of the, and, 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 and definitely for E. coli Klebsiella, uh, and, 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 and you know, most of the patients are colonized but not infected. So uh, they don't really receive any antibiotic that will uh, 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 reduce their transmission. Uh, moreover, I would even say that for most of what we know, most antibiotic agents increase transmission and do not decrease transmission. So, uh, you know, you can incorporate in those models an agent that will reduce, I think it will have, at least for E. coli and Klebsiella, it will have a, 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 a minimal effect. Um, I think that for MRSA, for example, it can be a very different story if you include, you know, a search and destroy policy as done in some countries, and that may have a big impact, but that's, again, it's not incorporated in our models. It can be incorporated, and we have models that we can answer. Truly, I think we have now the capability, if a public health authority approaches us and tell us we have this problem, what we should do, we can ask them different questions and fit a model to their own specific place uh, and, 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 and advise on uh, the effectiveness of different intervention. But that, that has to be tailored with more data to a specific condition. Um, we just have time for one more question, so I'll give uh, an opportunity to someone who hasn't uh, answered a asked a question. Thank you. Garen Sappen from the World Alliance Against Antibiotic Resistance and AMR Control. You showed a remarkable correlation between the spread of drug infection and the lack of infection prevention and control uh, one, on one of your graphics, and I think it's amazing that there is a lot of accent uh, a lot of funding on providing new antibiotics, but very, very little attention on the part of member states or policymakers on the need to strengthen infection prevention and control, including the technologies that would be needed so we have much safer health systems and prevent the spread of AMR. I'd like your further comments on this. I appreciate your intervention. So um, I, I, I completely agree that those are complementary uh, events and infection prevented is much better than to treat an infection and I think we need to do a lot and we can do a lot in preventing infections in different ways and preventing resistance in different ways. Once we, you have resistance and you have patients that you need to treat, of course antibiotics are extremely important. Thank you. Yeah. Go to the panel you discussion. Did, you did just remain over there. It was a fascinating lecture. But the one point, you all, your models always assume that there will be an increase in resistance. But we do now situation like for pneumococci, where we see a decrease because this is due to clonal spread and differences which are unrelated to campaigns, unrelated to anything else. It's just the bug itself. Did you incorporate that into the model? In other words, sometimes the resistance may be labile and may disappear. Yeah, so, um, uh, well, I'm sorry, but again, an excellent question. <laughs> I think, you know, we, we, you know, I think that uh, it was very difficult for us to fit sigmoid models, for example, for MRSA, uh, because in most countries that we have data on, MRSA is decreasing and not increasing or, uh, or at least stable. So um, uh, you can fit different models to different organisms, and again, I have to say our models are as good as the data that is available. If there will be better surveillance systems that provide, and I think it's crucial to have, I think those models show how crucial it is, uh, if we would have more data from more countries on more organisms, even if it's a dirty data, not very accurate, not with the perfect methodology and so on, but we will have data, we could generate a, an organism specific and update it on a real time because we hope to be able to maintain it and update it on a re and, and, and update it in real time to, to, to change the predictions uh, from year to year.